，老师，哎、欸，各位同学，哎、欸，还是应该讲学弟妹，大家好。然后，哎、欸，我是九五级的学生啊，自贡系，然后我叫徐立文。那，哎、欸，我从大概一九九九年左右吧，开始玩 FreeBSD 啊。然后，那个二零零七年的时候，那时候在黄世坤老师的实验室啊，然后成为 Committer， 嗯，到现在。然后后来就一直常跟那个 FreeBSD community 有接触啊。那这次很高兴，就是旧局他刚好要出差到那个北京，然后就说：“哎，那个可不可以顺道来台湾？那个就是宣传一下 FreeBSD， 然后跟学校啊、社群有些互动，对吧？”那旧局他是非常长时间的 FreeBSD 贡献者。那，哎，他当那个 FreeBSD c o a t i n g 应该有三届还是四届了吧？那 FreeBSD c o a t i n g 它就是在所有 Committer 里面互相选举，每两年一任。那 FreeBSD Project 里面就是有九位，那就是所以可以当选都是那种德高望重、有贡献的人。然后他同时也是那个 FreeBSD Foundation， 就是 FreeBSD 基金会的诶、欸、董事会成员之一。那他大部分在做的事情就是那个。要求赞助，然后拿到钱以后呢，就买机器啊，或者是提供那个 conference 的预算等等的。所以就是，诶、欸，为 FreeBSD 在各方面贡献非常多。那今天他就要介绍说，诶、欸，他当然他的学术成就也很高。他那个今天要介绍的是那个那个 d e t r e s 的，他跟那个投影片上另外一位叫做 Robert Watson。他也是 Foundation 跟那个 c o t i n g 的成员，他同时也是剑桥大学的教授。他们开了一门课，就是用 d t r a c e 啊 Tracing 这些 tool 来教 Operating System。好，那现在就把时间给 j o r g e i t s your turn。谢谢。And that's the only Mandarin you're going to hear me say.、Um, so. My name is George Neville Neal. Thank you, Luen, for introducing me. I'd like to talk、uh, today about teaching、uh, system software with FreeBSD and tracing. So,、um, developing a new set of courses for operating systems is not an easy thing to do. It takes a lot of work. So the question is, why did we do this?、Um, so Robert Watson and I, who've worked on this for the last two plus years.、Um, Saw that there were a few problems in the way operating systems and large systems are taught,、um, and so some of our some of the things we wanted to do was to promulgate to push some ideas about how one understands large, complicated systems,、uh, because almost all systems that are being built now are large and complicated, and and they include millions of lines of software,、um, and in a system that big, being able to understand large systems is actually the most important skill. Um, being able to type thousands of lines of code is not as useful as being able to understand millions of lines of code.、Um, the second thing we wanted to do was to bring some more modern tools to a variety of audiences, and we'll talk about those audiences in a minute.、Um, we also saw the need to advance the practice of software and systems engineering.、Uh, if you look at the failures of large systems、um, in industry. You can trace a lot of those failures to the inability of the engineers who built them to understand the implications of large systems. And lastly,、uh, we both work on FreeBSD and have for many years. And we felt that FreeBSD was a platform for teaching research and development that、uh, we could use this material to promote. So I'm going to talk about、uh, three separate audiences for this course. I'm going to talk a lot about the master's course because that's the first course we developed, and that Robert is still teaching at the University of Cambridge. He's teaching, I think, the third version of it at the moment.、Um, I'll mention、uh, also how we teach undergraduates in computer science, as well as practitioners, which are, in English, when we say a practitioner, we mean someone like me who's no longer in school and just writes code.、Um, It's interesting to note that,、uh, unlike when I went to school 20 years ago,、um, people who study computer science at the master's and PhD level often don't have an undergraduate degree in computer science.、Uh, it used to be that people would get a bachelor's in computer science and then a master's and then a PhD. 
but many people who go on to work in computer science now have a different science background. They might have been in physics or biology or some other area. Um, so this course actually has to take that into account. Um, undergraduates in computer scientists in computer science. Um, again, when I studied computer science and programming, um, generally people who went into computer science had been hobbyists as kids. Uh, they had some experience with computers. Now people, you know, they're in high school and they pick, I'm going to be a computer programmer, I'm going to be a computer scientist. So the, the material we produce has to um, take that into account. And of course, uh, many people who first study system software, uh, that's their first experience with the C programming language, right? So a lot of people learn Java as their first language or if it's a bad day, PHP. Um, but they may not actually know C when they start, so then that turns out to be important in this course. So the way operating systems are taught at universities, uh, there's a few different styles of this material. And so the first one is something we call trial by fire. Um, and in trial by fire, this is often an undergraduate course, um, using either a toy operating system or some cut down version of Linux or BSD, but usually a toy operating system. Um, we make the students, the undergraduates, um, recreate classical parts of the operating system design on their own. So you have to modify the scheduler or you add something to the file system or you know, some component like that. And when you're teaching at a university, um, you have a limited amount of time with the students. Uh, Cambridge, where we developed the graduate course, actually has a very limited teaching schedule. It's only about eight weeks. Uh, US courses tend to be 12 weeks long, and I suspect Taiwan probably follows the US model a little more. But in eight to 12 weeks, taking someone who has never programmed in C and then making them modify an operating system is actually extremely difficult. And it means that a lot of the students don't, not only do they fail the course, or fail a course, but they don't learn very much. I mean, the goal of teaching is to get people to learn, not to just give them a grade. So trial by fire is, um, and this is the way, oh, I've got a laser. Um, this is the way I took operating systems when I was, when I was young. Um, graduate courses tend to focus on a lot of reading. So instead of writing a lot of code or modifying a lot of systems or producing what we call an artifact, um, something new, uh, we give the students, the graduate students, a lot of papers about, you know, virtual memory systems or, you know, networking systems or file systems or some component of the operating system. Uh, they read that and they discuss it, but they don't do as much practical work. And one of the things Robert and I wanted to come out of the graduate course was that the graduate students also had done practical work in computer science. So what we've developed, um, in reaction to these two things is what we call a deep dive experimentation course. And this is something we've applied to the master's students as well as undergraduates, as well as practitioners. The idea is that we can give you a system that you can modify um, without having to you know, learn kernel programming from the beginning in 12 weeks. Um, so currently this, Robert put graduate in here because this is the one that he's teaching. Um, but the idea is that you can understand how the operating system works. And because we're using a tracing system as opposed to having people modify the underlying kernel itself, we can show them a lot more. Right? So the goal of the course is to show a very broad spectrum of the things in the operating system. So in the first type of course, by the end, you might have modified a device driver or modified the scheduler. Uh, by the end of this course, you will have touched um, the scheduler, the virtual memory system, the networking stack, and the file system. Well, not always the file system, but often the file system. So number three is only possible due to Dtrace, which I'll mention quite a bit during the, the class, um, which is an integrated tracing and profiling tool uh, available on FreeBSD, macOS, and Illumos. So what is Dtrace and why do we use it? Um, so I'm going to talk a lot about what we use. So um, Dtrace is a dynamic tracing framework. So normally when people have a bug, they either turn on a debugger or they put a lot of printfs in their code and they recompile their code. Uh, you all laugh, so I know you know what I'm saying. Um, 
But what you really want, and it turns out what uh, the company Sun wanted, was a framework for tracing that they could ship in a working kernel. So the original motivation is you're selling big, expensive computers to banks. Um, there is a problem at the bank. The bank calls you. And the thing the bank does not want to hear your developer say is, recompile the kernel and try the bug again. Yeah, that's very bad. So um, the folks at Sun developed DTrace, Dynamics Tracing Framework. The goal is a low impact on overall system performance because, as you all know, if you add printfs to your code everywhere, your code runs a lot slower. Um, so the framework itself is designed to have a low impact. Uh, when it's not on, it doesn't incur any overhead. It does this in a clever way. It's a rootkit. Um, engineered for safety, so the idea is that you can't panic the kernel, developed for Solaris. Um, so why do we use a system like this? So I said one of the styles of teaching for uh, operating systems was to have people modify the kernel. Well, if you modify the kernel incorrectly, then you're going to crash your operating system, and you're going to spend all of your time debugging something, you know, something trivial or some corner case instead of actually looking at the system. So with DTrace, because it actually allows us to look at everything in the system, um, we can give students a tour of the operating system and talk about various parts of the frameworks. Low risk of crash in the kernel. Um, used in production systems. So all of the Solaris boxes that have ever been shipped in the last number of years have it. Um, products that are built with FreeBSD have it. Um, Mac OS has it. Your, if you have an Apple phone, your Apple phone happens to have it. Um, it has a really powerful scripting language, and there are these things called DTrace one-liners. So I'm going to do something very silly. Never give a live demo. <laughs> Let's see if I can get to my windows. Oh, look, it's a live demo. I can't see it on my screen, thanks to that. But uh, um, so for instance, if you wanted to look at the performance or uh, if you wanted to look inside what was going on in the operating system, normally you would have to recompile the kernel or do something special. Um, this is a virtual machine version of FreeBSD. Um, and I've got this little script here. Wow, I can type blind. Okay, so now I'm exercising the file system. I'm running a find over the file system, which says go through the entire file system and touch and look at every file. Not touch it, but look at every file. Except I'm not root, so I get my permission denied. But in the background, I'm actually running this Descript. And when I finish it, it's going to show me the performance I'm going to have to go look at my screen. It's going to show me the performance of everything in the system, what took up all the time. And you can see that there's a bunch of these things in the kernel, which we're not going to talk about at the moment. But it's telling us um, where the time was spent. Now, doing this without this tool would have required us building a tremendous amount of software. So the idea is that when we teach people about operating systems, what we do first is we talk about the structures. So if you've taken an OS class, I'm sure you've seen someone describe the structure of the file system. But with that description, <clears throat> using some very simple code, um, that's a bunch of comments. Usage. There we go. Um, using uh, a little back further. There we go. Um, using less than 100 lines of scripting code, not C compiled code, not C++, I didn't have to build anything. I can start analyzing the performance of the kernel. And I can start explaining the performance of the kernel to a class. Right? And so that's one of the reasons that we're, we've used this technology. For once, my live demo actually worked. Let's see if I can get back to my slides. 
And so this is, this is my canned example. So operating systems are large, complex pieces of software. And the main interface from user programs to that software is the system call interface. So you can see here that there are 2,148 match probes. And what that means in D-Trace is there are 2,148 points um, of system calls that I can look at. Actually, D-Trace automatically creates all of the probe points for you to look at. So there are over 50,000 probes in most systems, Mac OS, FreeBSD. Um, but for just system calls, there's, um, there's over 1,000 system calls. And each one has an entry and a return point, And you can look at all of them. So this is a canned example of just look at all the system calls. And D-Trace is low overhead enough that if you start tracing all the system calls, the system doesn't come to a halt. Right? Imagine if you put a printf in every system call in a kernel. The system would, very, would get much slower. So what do we teach people? Um, so for the master's students, uh, we're trying to teach them two things. First of all, we're trying to teach them how to understand large systems. But we also, because they're graduate students, we need to teach them uh, the skills they need to do research. The goal of a master's course, particularly at a school like Cambridge, is to lead people onto a PhD and to do systems research. Um, so we teach them both methodology and practice, right? So what are the methods by which they can evaluate the things that they're building, um, as well as what are the best practices to do that? And our goal all along is always to do uh, look at real world operating system artifacts. So um, many undergraduate and graduate courses are taught on toy operating systems, operating systems that aren't complete and that you would never actually use in a real production system. And our goal is to make it so that people can actually use a production system in their research and in their teaching so that when they go out into industry, uh, if they go into industry or if they go into further research, um, they can actually translate those skills. Uh, we also have to teach them scientific writing and presentation as graduate students, which is interesting. Um, and then we have them read a bunch of uh, original systems research papers. So I said that we don't have a lot of time to teach them. Um, it's six one-hour lectures, five two-hour practical labs. Um, the labs are geared to uh, have the students explore the system. And we'll look at some of the labs in a minute. Um, they have assigned readings. And then we assess their lab reports. Um, so they write three lab, uh, four lab reports for the master's course. And we take the first lab report. You'll all appreciate this as students. And we throw it away. Because usually their writing on the first lab report is terrible. So, uh, and then we. We take the lab report, we give them the, their uh, marks back, but we don't actually count it. With three core books, um, The Art of Computer Systems Performance Analysis. If you are a computer science student, you should definitely read this if you ever want to understand the performance of a system. Um, it's the only book written on this that is readable. And I really wish Jane would update it because 1991 is a long time ago. It's, it's before many of you were born. Um, we also use uh, a book about D-Trace by Brennan Gregg. And then unsurprisingly, we use the book that I wrote with Robert and Kirk McCusick as the main operating systems textbook. And I see there's one on the desk over there. So what we teach throughout the master's course, and this is very similar to the undergraduate course as well, is we give them an introduction to what is an operating system kernel and what is tracing and how does it work. Um, and then we give them a really simple lab where they measure IO performance. Um, and this is the kind of stuff that we bring up. You don't need to read the slide. Um, we talk about the course. Uh, we talk about general purpose operating systems. Um, and we get people to sort of all understand what we think of as an operating system. Right? So if you ask people now, if you often ask students, what is an operating system, they usually don't really know. And so we have to sort of get them to understand what an operating system is generally, what it's supposed to be there for, what its purpose is. Um, and we do things like this. We talk about um, kernel tracing and how it works. And this is actually 
a diagram of how DTrace works within the FreeBSD kernel. So this is kind of an eye chart. It's a little small. Um, but if you look at the top, you'll see that there's a DTrace command here. And what it's doing is it's tracing all the users of malloc. Right? So if you've got um, a program like Apache or Nginx or Chrome, when it goes to get memory, it calls malloc. Um, and one of the important things to understand is how is memory being used by a program? So um, we explain in the class um, you know, how the function boundary trace provider works, how probes work, uh, where we get the data from, how we get the data back, and how we get the output. So we go through all of how kernel tracing works. And then we talk about the probe effect. So um, I keep mentioning printf, um, but any technology, well, printf is not a technology, but anyway, anything like printf, yeah, anything like printf or a debugger or something that you attach to a program to extract data, um, to get something out of it, has what we call a probe effect. Right, because you've attached a probe to the system, and instead of running through the instructions it was going to run through in the first place to do some calculation or to write data to disk or to write read data from the network, it's instead going to come through the instruction chain, and then it's going to jump off over here and do something else. And the reason that printf is so terrible is it has a very high probe effect. Um, and so any system, including DTrace, will have some effect on the underlying system, sort of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle for, uh, for computer systems. And so we have to explain this, um, and we teach about this when we first talk about kernels and tracing, because otherwise the students won't know why when they run a benchmark within tracing and a benchmark outside of tracing, why are they getting different results, and how do they re relate the results to each other? You know, is the probe effect uh, linear? Or is the probe effect exponential? Uh, so we talk a lot about that. And how does kernel code run? Uh, we talk about the process model because the process model is the basis of all modern computing. Um, everyone who writes a program that is not a deeply embedded program is running in a process. And um, understanding how processes are built within the operating system is an important concept. Uh, and then we do two labs, the kernel implications of inter-process communication and microarchitectural implications of IPC. Um, and then we have them write a lab on IPC performance. So here's an example of explaining the process model. Um, you know, the way processes have been built uh, over time has really changed. This is a really ancient diagram that Robert stole out of a book somewhere, I don't know where, from the 1970s. Um, but as you can see, over time, more and more components have wound up inside the process. So when people run a program, usually they know that that's a process. But if we're teaching them, we have to show them what shows up in a process. And it's no longer just a bunch of programs slapped together in memory. What is that? Um, with a little bit of shared math routine. You know, eventually we get to, you know, in the 80s this is sort of a more traditional Unix model, but you can see that, you know, we went from not having threads to having threads. Uh, you see the runtime linker, uh, and then you see the, you know, various stacks and threads growing down. Um, ah, he stole this from Multics. Um, so this is Multics, which was a system before I was born. Um, Multics, Unix, and then the evolution of, of Unix. Um, and we talk about things like runtime linking, how programs actually get linked together by the kernel when they execute. And we talk about the foundations of virtual memory and traps and system calls. So in the second um, one of these, second uh, process model lecture, we talk about virtual memory, um, how memory actually gets mapped, you know, where the pages are, um, and how you know, that gets organized in memory, and then how that gets built up in real physical memory. Um, because this organization, the organization of the virtual memory system, has um, a big impact on overall systems performance. And it's one of the things we have them look at. Because um, people may understand the idea of virtual memory, the fact that your address in memory is not the same thing as your address, your virtual address is not the same thing as a physical address. But they often don't un appreciate the uh, effects of architecture. So how big your cache is, how big your TLB is. There's a bunch of 
<clears throat> technologies that have been developed over time as part of supporting virtual memory uh, that have a big impact on, on the performance and understanding how systems actually work in the real world. So we talk about you know, how VMs, how virtual memory provides security and reliability. Um, we look at system call trap performance using D-Trace. So one of the basic measures of the performance of an operating system is how much, how, how little can it execute while doing the job it needs to do. So if you call write, if you are gonna write data to disk, um, what you really want the system to do is take all that data and put it on disk. You don't care what it does between when you call write and when the data is put on disk. But the performance of that segment is really important. So we have them analyze system call and trap performance. Um, and we describe the virtual memory system design, which is probably the most common virtual memory system in Unix at the moment, which is the mock uh, VM, because it's the one that wound up in Mac OS as well as in the BSDs. Then we come to the network stack. We teach them about TCP IP. Um, we talk about the state machine. And one of the nice things that we can do um, is with dtrace, we can have them trace the entire state machine of TCP without writing new C code. And we have them measure latency and bandwidth. And then we have them relate those together in a, in a lab report. Um, so here's our little examples of um, networking the sockets API. This is what actually happens to your um, write when you write to disk, uh, write to network or read from the network. Um, and we go through all the layers and we have them measure layer by layer what's going on. <clears throat> and then we relate that to memory flow across hardware and software. So one of the nice things we can do because we don't have to have people write a lot of new C code um, is we can start to look at the underlying, modern underlying hardware. The model under which many systems programming and operating systems courses is taught um, is a very simplified model. Actually, the, the processing model looks more like a VAX, which is a system that nobody has used in 20 years. Um, real computers on real, you know, that computer or even your phone or a server are much more complex from a hardware standpoint. And that complexity actually affects the way the operating system works. So the effect of multiple cores, the effect of multiple caches, and the effect of moving data from the network through the memory subsystem is actually visible using a system like D-Trace. And so we try to show that to the students so that they can actually understand how that works. So we talked about, talked to them about all the kernel data structures, the organization of the network stack. Um, so these are the kinds of things that we want them to be able to figure out. Um, this is an example of the TCP state machine um, between, well, the messages exchanged between two nodes, setting up, transferring data, and tearing down a connection. Um, this is a graph of congestion control in TCP, uh, showing how TCP is performing. <clears throat> and for graduate students in particular, this is the kind of thing that we want them to be able to build. We want them to be able to run an experiment and then to generate graphs based on that. So we talk about um, new features in network stacks. Um, we go through all the key data structures. And then we look at um, network stack performance across hardware and software, which, which things are affecting the performance of the system. So let's talk a bit about the labs. This is what we teach the course on. That's a BeagleBone Black, um, which is an ARM V7-based um, SOC, a little bit like a Raspberry Pi, um, but a lot more reliable. So we thought about using the Raspberry Pi. And considering that the Raspberry Pi was developed at Cambridge, it's very funny that we didn't use it. Um, but we didn't use it for two reasons. Uh, one is it's missing a hardware feature we require for the class. So one of the things we have the students do is run performance analysis. And it turns out that on the original RPi, not the newer ones, they left off a single interrupt line. And that interrupt line was the one that fired the performance counters. So no performance counters on the original RPi. Um, and the other thing we discovered is that this board has better electrical um, tolerance. Uh, the RPi's tended to reboot, and that's bad. Uh, we don't like them to spontaneously reboot. So this board's about 
that big, and each student gets two to play with during the class, and they do their homework on this. Um, so these are the specs. The thing, another thing that's really nice about it is that unlike, say, having students work on big server equipment um, in a laboratory, the constrained environment of this chip means that they notice performance problems faster. So the L1 and L2 caches, which tend to show performance problems, um, once you fall out of cache, your performance goes down, are very small. And so the students almost instantly will see this in their experiments. Um, we give them an SD card software image. Another thing that we wanted to do, along with not making them constantly burn their fingers by, you know, by modifying the kernel, was you know, rebuilding the system. I mean, they could have done that, but that's not the goal of the course. And we give them a set of custom micro benchmarks for I.O., TCP. Um, and then in the most recent version of the course, um, for the graduate course, we switched to using uh, Jupyter Notebooks to do the analysis. Initially, we had all of the students using something called R, which is a very popular statistics package, um, to generate all of their graphs. That meant they spent a lot of time learning R. Um, and we didn't care if they learned R. We care if they learned operating systems. So um, we're using Jupyter Notebooks, and we give them uh, quite a bit of the framework around that. It turns out this time around, Robert thinks he gave them too much framework, and the homework was too easy. So it will become harder next time. Um, but that's how we're doing data co collection analysis. Here's what they look like on someone's laptop. Um, this is someone doing their homework. Look, they've got their book. Get rid of the Java book. Um, but this is the little RPI connected to a machine, and then the, the Jupyter Notebook is where the data winds up. And this is what a Jupyter Notebook, you know, this is the kind of code that they're putting inside of the Jupyter Notebook. And then they get these nice little graphs. So I said that one of the things that we uh, find with these um, BeagleBone Blacks is that because they have small caches and small TLBs, you know, they're not big Xeon server class machines, they quickly run out of performance, right? So this is a graph of buffer sizes, and you can see that performance improves as you would expect as you increase your buffers, because that means that you're only, you know, doing a bunch of work, overhead work for one chunk of data. So if you do it for 2K blocks, then you're doing it far more often if you did it on 4K blocks, 8K blocks, 16K blocks. Uh, but eventually, we top out and then we start to drop off as we fall out of the cache. So the moment that the cache or the TLBs don't have enough entries for your performance test, then your performance drops again. And this is the kind of thing that we want the students to be able to reproduce. Um, here's another good one. This, this one shows very clearly where all the performance problems are. This is a POSIX IO benchmark. So this is just moving data back and forth. Um, again, you can see performance really gets much better. And then we fall out of the L1, and it starts to drop. And then we, uh, we run out of TLB entries for the, for the VM system. And then now we've fallen out of L2, and then suddenly um, data drops off unless you have B0'd the buffer when you start, like if you've touched all the data. And this was reproduced by a student, right? This isn't our example. This is they did the homework. Um, Right. And so what we're doing here is, so for people who've done a little bit of, you know, people who have a back, background in some computer science, they think, oh, fewer system calls, larger buffers always will perform better. But it turns out that these things like caches and VM systems, so this is a TLB, really matter, right? So most people assume that if I can move two megs of data or 16 megs of data or 32 megs of data, if I just keep making my buffers larger, my performance will improve linearly. Uh, but it turns out that that's not true because of a lot of underlying effects. So we have them write a bunch of uh, lab reports, as I mentioned. This is so that they can prove that they did the homework. Um, we focus on a few things. One is writing, um, because as a graduate student, you have to write. You're going to write papers. And we want them to write good papers. And we want them to write papers to get accepted at conferences. So we need to improve their, help them improve their writing. Um, also, teaching them the scientific method, which it turns out is not taught to undergraduates sometimes. Um, 
And then things like variance and error. Um, if you ever want to get a zero on a paper you give to Robert Watson, don't have any error bars. Right? Just have a flat line with no error bars. You need to have error bars. Um, and then explanation of results. So uh, one of the last labs we have them do is that they derive the TCP state machine. So you, if you look at the original specification for TCP, it has a diagram that looks like this. Uh, or if you look at the design and implementation book um, or Stephen's book on TCP IP, you'll always see this, you know, see some graph that looks like this, that sockets start in a closed state and then they go either to li listen or they connect via consent, this very complicated um, state machine, which is how all of the internet works, at least for TCP. Um, but it turns out that this is not, well, this one, which is derived, is more honest than the specification. Because as we all know, there are specifications and there are code, and they don't always work the same. So by using tracing, coming back to the detrace point, and being able to look at TCP as it executes, um, as opposed to just assuming that the diagram is right, the students are actually able to derive a real TCP state machine diagram and also find bugs. So we've had students, you know, actually the first year, um, one of the students found an, you know, a bug, an old bug in the TCP stack that was very rarely triggered, but was triggered by the, by the lab. Um, so that's what we've been doing in the graduate course. Uh, what are we gonna do next? So um, I can't believe I've been working on this for three years. Uh, so Robert first taught this in 2014. We spent the summer uh, developing the course originally, and then 2015, 2016, um, started refining the material, and then this time around is when we added the Python notebooks, Python Jupyter notebooks. Um, and we are scheduled to open source all this material again in February. So one of the other things about this course, and one of the reasons I present this at universities, is we're trying to get people to teach the same material. We've actually built up all of this material on a GitHub repo and on a website so that other universities can start using it as well. Um, I'll mention briefly, I'll talk briefly about the undergraduate course, mostly is comparing it to the graduate course. Um, so obviously for undergraduates who don't have a lot of background in computer science um, or who you know, are just learning computer science, usually operating systems are taught in the third year of a four-year program, generally, third or fourth, usually the third year. Um, but often undergraduates have very little background material uh, themselves in operating systems, so we have to teach them a lot more. Uh, we need to talk a lot more about why. Like, why do we have virtual memory? Right, so, you know, that's a good question. A lot of people just sort of take it for granted, but they don't know why it's there. Um, so we go into the why because the why motivates the things that make VMs, VM work, virtual memory work. Um, it's really important that you know, we have to pace the material. Uh, I just recently, well, re in the summer I taught an undergraduate session of this. And with, undergrad with graduate students, you can sort of say a bunch of things and then make them go do the work. With undergraduates, we have to stop and make sure they understood us and repeat or the class will be lost. Uh, we don't like that. <clears throat> and then the big goal for me in the undergraduate course is get them to understand how a whole system works all at once, um, usually by showing them a large piece of system software. So things that we wind up teaching more of um, and explaining more of in the undergraduate course are things like mutual exclusion, right? So this is the classic thing where, you know, two pieces of code on two different cores can't be touching the same data structure at once. But why? How does it work? What is a deadlock? What does a deadlock look like? Um, we talk about virtual memory in depth. We talk about file system principles and networking principles. Um, many people, even those who've taken some networking courses, usually networking courses focus on TCP at the programming level, not about how TCP works. So the concept of asynchrony or a loss of packets um, in a network is something that a lot of students may not get in their networking course. And we, want, um, we talk about the name cache. And lastly, the example that I always give them at the end of the class is actually one of my interview questions. So when I interview you know, new, new students uh, at companies, I make them answer a question like, what happens when 
when a, a web page is lo loaded over the internet, and I make them talk about it in depth. So the example we give them here is, look, there's some data. Um, and we go all the way through from generating a process like SH, which will fork, which will exec, which will generate a, a master program, um, which will allocate a bunch of memory pages, and then somewhere in the internet, some other shell forks and execs Chrome, and now you have Chrome, and it's got a bunch of memory pages, and then the server on the top is gonna open a socket, it's gonna bind to that socket, it's gonna listen on that socket. Chrome is also gonna create a socket. It's gonna to connect to the foreign server. It's gonna write a request. It's going to, that's gonna be read by the master. And then Chrome is gonna block in read waiting for the data coming back. So the master is gonna open a file, it's gonna read the file, it's gonna dirty a page. So this is where we talk about the virtual memory system. We load data from disk, we put it into virtual memory. Um, if it's a well-behaved server, it's going to close the file. Um, it's then going to write it to the network. The read will complete. That data will appear on the other side. Chrome is going to close the socket, as will the master, and they will do the four-way close uh, for TCP. The connection will disappear. Chrome will exit. Nobody ever uses Chrome this way. Chrome runs forever until it runs out of memory. Um, which is usually in about three hours, but you know, let's leave that alone. Um, Chrome will exit, the shell will collect the exit code. Oh wait, I've left a bunch of memory behind, right? And so we ask them the question of why is this here? So we walk by, by the end of the undergraduate course, we expect them to be able to answer using Dtrace all of these questions. How does all of this work? Where would I look in the operating system for this? And that means that by the end of the course, they really understand a large number of uh, components of the operating system and how they interact. One of the problems that I have with um, the way sort of the, the toy courses are taught is they don't focus on the interaction of components. And if you don't understand the interaction of components in, a, in an operating system, you don't understand the operating system. Right, just understanding how these hundred lines of code work doesn't cut it. You have to understand what happens everywhere else in the system because an operating system kernel is a single, large, very dangerous program <laughs> um, that will crash on you. All right, I'll mention the practitioner's cars brief briefly. Um, this is something I teach at conferences. I can assume a lot more background. Um, because I expect people who have a CS degree or who've been working in industry to understand some things. They probably don't understand kernel internals. Um, the idea here is more to give them tools to solve problems. Uh, it's taught over two days. Um, we teach them similar things to what we teach the masters and the undergraduate students, but we teach differently. Um, we're still talking about locking the scheduler. It's still an operating system. Um, but we teach it via a set of worked examples. So for an undergraduate course in particular, I have to you know, show diagrams of the virtual memory system and talk about how the virtual memory system works and talk about the data structures. But for someone who just wants to apply these things, uh, we just give them a bunch of examples to work through and we talk about what those mean with less of an emphasis on the theory. All right, so this is my thank you slide. These are all the people who've been working on these courses. Um, Russlin, Mark, Ed, Andy, Bjorn, uh, and the foundation, FreeBSD Foundation, has actually supported this work, supported my time on the work, and Robert's as well. Um, so I mentioned that this is open source because we wanted to develop a course that we could share with everyone, right? We wanted to really improve, um, and actually, if you want to write something down, steal the last, the last link goes everywhere, teachbsd.org. Um, so all of the original slide decks were written in Beamer because LaTeX is way better than PowerPoint. But it turns out most people teach in PowerPoint now, which is really depressing to me. <laughs> um, so I've been converting all my slides to PowerPoint, which is just, it's, it's really sad. Um, such is life. So uh, on the website, you'll find the slide decks. They're being um, uh, f f worked on right now. I think Robert's mostly done with the masters. I'm, two, I'm a third of the way done with the undergraduate. Practitioner course will be done before March. Um, this leads to a GitHub repo. So if you use the material or you like the material and you want to send us a pull request, please do. Although pull requests for PowerPoint, I don't know how that works. 
but you can also send us mail. Um, so we have things like teaching guides, problems, problems and solutions, marking guides. Uh, we have quizzes and final exams, but those are not public because it turns out students will go find them. Um, and then all of our scripts. We're eventually going to do video versions. And it's all under a BSD style license. So the idea is that people can just take it. You, you don't have to do anything else. And I think that is my last slide. So any questions about that? Yes? So for your master's course, mm. where you ask students to analyze instead of filming the Mm-hmm. Yes. So um, you mean instead of yes, instead of impl implementing yes, because for graduate students, what we expect them to be able to do is science, um, and with only especially with only eight weeks in the Cambridge version, um, we want them to get to the point of doing science more than we want them to get to the point of being able to say, I modified the scheduler. Um, generally, so because of the problems in doing real operating systems, this is what's led to the toy operating systems. Because if you crash the toy, it reboots quickly. If you crash Linux or FreeBSD, well, your environment is a much harder programming environment. So we, we feel the trade-off is worth it for the gradu graduate students. Other questions? Silence. OK, well, oh, one more. You can ask as many as you like. So for practitioners, mm. would like to take the um, so for the practitioner course, there are no quizzes or exams. There are only the lab examples. And all the lab examples are in the material. So those are all open and online. Because because the practitioner course is only taught over two days, sometimes three, um, there's really no time to give quizzes and, uh, and uh, exams. And the other thing is for practitioners, they, they're not, it's, not a certificate, it's not a certificate program. So there's no requirement for them to yeah, pass a test. Yeah, I was trying to. <laughs> ah. Okay. Yes. The beagle bone black. So, I am sure it's pointed to from there. But yeah, the beagle bone black. I'm, I'm sure you can get them here. They're about fifty U.S. dollars. Um, they're not very expensive. Yes. So if you go to so if you go to freebsd.org, there are images for the BeagleBone on FreeBSD, and you can just burn it to an SD card and boot it. Um, it's uh, we will also be hosting images with the tools, with the extra tools, but you can install FreeBSD from the website and do a BeagleBone today. Other questions. So um, when I say customize, so we have a bunch of these um, uh, benchmarks that we make the graduate students use in the graduate course. So that customized image will be on teachpsd.org or, or pointed to from there. But if you go to FreeBSD right now, a standard FreeBSD install, which includes Dtrace, is, is there to just play with. And, and mirrored here, right? Yeah, so there's a mirror of it in that room, <laughs> one of the servers. All right. Well, thank you very much.